I'm Saisha Grayson, the Smithsonian American Art Museum's curator of time-based media. And I couldn't be more ecstatic to welcome these two brilliant artists here to our stage. And I'm gonna keep my remarks really short so we have maximum time to hear and see what they have to share with us and each other today. And I'm just gonna warn you, I think they could probably go on for four or five hours, and so it's gonna be a little hard to feel like we're gonna to have to cut them short, but in that spirit, this event was posted as three to four, but that was a, a miscommunication. We're gonna go till 4.30 so that there's time for questions and answer uh, period as well. Uh, and if you need to leave at four, just um, do that. So for many of us, we first saw the world through Arthur Jaffa's lens when he was the award-winning director of photography on Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust, which we showed here last March. Since then, he has amassed an incredible CV that spans cinematography, sculpture, photography, collage, and moving image art, collaborating with luminaries from artists Carrie James Marshall and Kara Walker, to directors Spike Lee, to Stanley Kubrick and Ava DuVernay, musicians like Jay-Z, Solange, Cassandra Wilson, and Melvin Gibbs, to name a few. He started showing work in a visual art context back in 1999 and was included in the Whitney Biennale in, uh, Biennial in 2001. Fast forward since 2017, the touring exhibition Arthur Jaffa, a series of utterly improbable yet extraordinary renditions has crisscrossed Europe with stops in London, Berlin, Prague, Stockholm, and his newest video, The White Album, premiered at the Berkeley Art Museum in California before being featured along with monumental sculptures in the 2019 Venice Biennale. For this, JFA was awarded the Biennale's Golden Lion for best participation in the main exhibition. With Elisa Blunt Moorhead and Malik Saeed, JFA co-founded TNEG, which is, quote, a motion picture studio whose goal is to create a black cinema as culturally, socially, and economically central to the 21st century as was black music to the 20th century. And born in Mississippi and now based in Los Angeles, Jaffa also has DC ties as he was an alumnus of Howard University. In 2016, when his seven-minute video, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, debuted, one critic said, quote, it described America to itself. So when I joined Sam, as one of the first things I did was work with my then curatorial counterpart at the Hirshhorn, Mark Beasley, to propose a joint acquisition of this masterpiece, which you'll see in a moment. So to begin today's thank yous, I want to thank Mark and our respective directors, Melissa Chu at the Hirshhorn and Stephanie Stebich at the Sam, and Sam's board for supporting this partnership and AJ for letting us screen this newest entry to our time-based media art collection today. Jatavia Gary's distinctive vision is one I've been introduced to more recently, but when I first saw her short film, The Ecstatic Experience at the Whitney, uh, which you'll also see in a moment, I felt like my feet were suddenly bolted to the ground. I thought, here is an artist to be on the lookout for, and then suddenly her work was everywhere in Claudine Rankin's Racial Imaginary Institute show on whiteness at the kitchen, at my Smithsonian colleague Rhea Combs' uh, premier African American film festival at the National Museum of African American History and Culture last year, and in Hilton All's poetically crafted God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin at the David Zwerner Gallery. Up next, she's gonna have solo shows at New York's Paula Cooper Gallery and in LA at the Hammer Museum, almost simultaneously. And she's a founding member of the New Negress Film Society. And in 2016, she was the Terra Foundation of American Art Summer Artist in Residence in Giverny, France, creating work that I think we'll also get a taste of today. And she was named one of Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Filmmaking. In 2018, she was a Radcliffe Institute Fellow at Harvard University, and she's now a Creative Capital Fellow. She's born in Texas and now works between Dallas and New York, and I'm not sure if she has any DC connections, but maybe we'll find out or we can make them now. 
The spark for this particular pairing came in from researching more of Gary's work and seeing that she had made an experimental music video with and documentary profile of American rapper Cakes to Killer, who in 2013 was a rising talent in the LGBTQ hip hop scene. With JAFA coming into Sam's collection and the Smithsonian celebrating 2019 as the year of music, finding out more about how music fit into their creative processes and how they think about engaging both museum spaces and popular music in their work seemed like it might be a really exciting program. I was thrilled then to learn that the two artists knew and admired each other, but had never been in public conversation together. So here we are. I'd like to thank the Smithsonian Year of Music and Smithsonian's Because of Herstory initiatives for supporting this convergence. And then internally, I'd like to thank Sam's programs team, external affairs and development teams for helping to bring this day together. And of course, and most and always, I'd like to thank the artists for their work, for their insights, and for making space in their busy dance cards to come here and play some music with us. Thank y'all for coming today. It's really nice to see all of y'all's faces. Um, and thank, thank Arthur Jaffa for making time in his extremely busy schedule to come and sit with a, a very green young buck trying to make a way in the world. <laughs> and shout out to my mama who is in the audience. She came from Texas. <laughs> you did not just wave. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be really informal. In fact, you know, I don't even know what we're doing, um, <laughs> quite frankly. I pulled a few videos that I think are really cool. Um, and my dear brother Arthur is going to do whatever the Lord leads him to do. <laughs> or whoever leads him to do it. Um, and we'll have questions in the end. And we'll talk. And we'll be good to each other. And I'll stop talking now. Why you stop talking? <laughs> it's so funny to hear um, it said like we've never had a public conversation because we certainly have had private conversations. Um, <laughs> the first time I'm going to tell a crazy story. Um, I can't even really tell the story, right? Because some of the language is probably not appropriate. But um, in any event, a version of it is. The first time I actually remember a distinct impression of Jatavia was when a friend just sort of casually asked me one night, hey, you want to go out to this film screening in Brooklyn or something? It's this, it's this film society. I was like, what is, what is it? She was like, uh, it's, you know, some Negro, Negro filmmakers or something. I'm like, Negress. I'm just telling you what we she reclaim said. Reclaim the, the colonial term. term. That, was, that wasn't the time. She was just like, ah, I wasn't sure. So I was like, yeah, sure, of course. And uh, it was at a bar in Brooklyn. And I don't know, this is what? 2015. Maybe, 20, okay, you remember the date. Okay, 2015. A bar in Brooklyn in the middle of the night. I go in and Jatavi and a good friend of her, Stephanie. Shout I can't, out to Steph. I cannot use the language they use, but basically they were like, I don't even know how to do it without your Want bad me to do language. It? You can do it. Me and Steph went up to Arthur. We had a, we were a few drinks in. And we said, why don't you mentor any of the women? You mentor all the men. How come you don't mentor us? And there was some, oh. <laughs> nah, she gave a very clean I did. I cleaned it, it up because my mama is in the, in the audience. And she's saved. Um, but we, I did. <laughs> I did use some colorful language. She did. She did. So why don't you mentor the girls? The I was like. Yeah. <laughs> we accosted him. We, we rolled up to Arthur Jaffa and we were like, yo, we're young filmmakers. Well, the first thing you said, and this is the clean version of it, was Arthur Jaffa in the house coming to support. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. But it was super aggressive. Like, if you can imagine, like three times more aggressive. So I was like definitely on my heels, like what have I gotten into? And then she went into the whole thing about how come I don't mentor any 
uh, female filmmakers, to which I responded, like, who am I, who are you talking about? I'm mentoring. And she said, oh, this person, that person. And I said, well, I don't really mentor people per se. I have relationships with associates, you know, and it's really about people approaching me. And I said, have you ever called me, Jatavia? And I hadn't. She had not. Who calls Arthur Jaffer? Y'all be calling Arthur? Do y'all call Arthur Jaffer? <laughs> that was that was Tyrone. <laughs> we we playing that. Uh, um, yeah, but so and then we kind of we started having a more. I would say you have to tell them the rest of it because I okay because I'm trained well. Despite cursing him out the, 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 in that night, I emailed him the next day and was like, "Yo, I'm really sorry." Like, I can't believe I did that. And what did I say? You said, you're apologizing? Would Lady Day apologize? Would Charles Mingus apologize? So I, like, he was disgusted that I was now taking it back, you know? Because it was this, like, old timid version. I know that shit wasn't real, excuse my language. It definitely wasn't real. <laughs> it was like some timid version of her. And I was like, what is this? I liked it better when you guys were running me out of there, so. Well, I'm glad that you came. Oh, yeah. And so we've continued to have a conversation. We always sort of pseudo argue, right? I'm not arguing with you, Arthur. I'm stating my case. You're coming out of left field with crazy she, shit all the time. She always, like, she always says, what? You, she says something about I'm getting in her tea or something. I don't know what you were saying. You were I'm a millennial, so I'd be using yeah, lingo yeah. that he may not be clued yeah. in on. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so we sort of continued to have a dialogue, and of course, I've uh, watched, you know, Jatavia's stuff develop, and you know, we were just talking to Fumilayo here, and uh, who just came up. She's somewhere in the audience, but, and I told um, Jatavia, I was like, oh, Fumilayo is the first uh, black experimental filmmaker that I ever sort of knew of, even, and uh, had even heard of, and it's really interesting because. I've always felt like this whole question of like, what is an experimental black film in the first place? I mean, because I think it's interesting because I do think if you really are engaged with the whole question of black cinema, because I think it is a question, then it almost de facto has to be experimental if it's engaged with the question. Now, of course, there's a lot of people who make films who are black or who make films about black people um, where it's not experimental, or, and I don't necessarily even consider those things black cinema. I get into trouble sometimes. You ain't um, gonna get in no trouble with me, so don't censor now. No, I'm just saying, you know, I, <laughs> I have to be really careful though, because there's certain entities in the world, I'm not trying to run afoul of right. them. Um, there's power out there. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> you know. But, you know, like I remember somebody was just saying to me recently, and this is like a real pet peeve of mine. Um, they came up to me and they started talking about, okay. Black Panther, and being, you know, under control of where I am, I just sort of didn't say anything, and the person was all raving, right, and I'm just like, and they were like, what? You, yeah, like, you have a problem with the Black Panther? And I just shrugged my shoulders, because I wasn't really trying to go there, I just said, and they started you know, running off all this stuff about the Black Panther, and I just was still shrugging. And then finally my man just said, but it made a billion dollars. To which my response was, so did slavery. <laughs> so, and this is not to say that the Black Panther doesn't have some winning aspects of qualities. I think oftentimes we try to operate in a I mean, I, li I like to say we try to operate in a remedial universe as if the bad guys always have the black hats and the good guys always have the white hats. But in the real world, things come mixed. They always mix. So it's not like if you see something, it's going to be like all bad. If it's all bad, it probably has no ability to actually engage people. So the Black Panther certainly has, it has some qualities that are interesting or admirable, I would say. And, I'm, and, 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 and I say this, I also have the highest respect for Ryan Coogler, like as an individual, as a young man, as a film, black filmmaker who actually navigated the whole Marvel thing and made a film that had some 
personality left over, right? It's probably, of all the Marvel films, it's the only one that actually you could say you have a sense of a specific director actually made it, as opposed to Marvel just kicked it out, right? Good or bad. But having said that, despite some of these qualities that it might have, you know, it's just got some things in it that I just find reprehensible. And I just don't, I don't know if you could make a film good enough where it would actually um, counteract those aspects. Not the least of which, one of the things that I, why I designated it as an abomination at the end of the day is because, um, you know, it has, it's a film that's constructed, and I can say a lot of things about it, but it's a film that's constructed so that the audience is supposed to be cheering for a white CIA agent in Africa, right? Who's in Africa, who's actually shooting out of the sky African operatives who are doing what their dutifully elected king told them to do, which happens to be, let's go arm oppressed people in the world. And we're supposed to cheer for that? That, I can't, I can't I mean, when you say that. it plainly like that, then people are like, oh, you know? Yeah. When you say there's a white CIA agent who comes. Given the history of the CIA yeah. in Africa. And, people and we're cheering them to shoot down black folks. Like I'm saying, uh, what's his name, Killmonger? He wasn't no, um, it wasn't no coup d'etat. He came in, he was of royal blood, first of all. He followed the rules as they had constructed the rules. He defeated T'Challa, mano mano, as they say, and he was a new king. He did it the way they say you're supposed to do it. So, and when he says, like, enough of this, let's arm black people in the world, oppress people, with this, so they can defend themselves, I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of cool, you know? Me so too, now I we think change. So too. <laughs> you know, so I'm just like, I know Malcolm and, you know, every, all the people we care about, I know they're just turning in their graves when black people are cheering that shit on, you know? So I think. I mean, I'm not going to say too much about Black Panther. But I, I'm in the same Wakanda lane. Wakanda never. That's me. Wakanda never. That is true. I'm in the same, I feel like I'm in this, we're in the same boat, right? I'm looking at these things real skeptically because I make films and I make experimental films and because I'm a black radical, you know? But I have to, I feel like as I get older, a part of me does feel like I'm pulling back about my public critique. And I don't know if I'm happy about that as much, but I'm being honest here with y'all um, because I do see a bunch of shit out there and I see power and I see money moving and a lot of deals being made and you know you're just like let me not run afoul of it's, you know the black there's nothing wrong with making money I'm not against making yeah. money I mean, I'm you trying make to make money. some money yeah. I'm, I'm doing alright <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never been against somebody black folks in particular me making neither. money but the thing about it is uh, I just feel like we have to be really careful that we don't mix mix metaphors in a mm -hmm. sense because I, you know, and I've said this in public before, but I think a lot of times, you know, there's some people out here who are winning at winning. They aren't really winning at art. Absolutely. Or even at that. cinema, or anything yeah. like that. They're just being successful. Right. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I think that should be celebrated. I think there's something to be said for just celebrating a black person winning, period, mm -hmm. right? But I do think it's also important to have some sort of critical specificity about what it is that we're celebrating though. Like I don't want to celebrate somebody, you know, who got an award but the film is shit. Same. Or vice versa. You know what I mean? Or someone I said, who's making amazing who are, who's making films and making deals and making money, but they're enacting the same structure. Right. That a that a, a white executive with all the money right. in the world and no connection to the community. They're enacting the same systemic power yeah, exactly. structure. Like, if you're keeping somebody else out of the situation, then to me, how are you any different? Yeah. So I just think it's, like, really important. That, and so that goes back to the central question of the whole black cinema thing, because I do feel like, and these are, like, you know, if you've ever seen me give a talk, very old examples or analogies that I like to use, but I think they're, people can understand them. Uh, like, one of the things I like to say, like, if you take, um, like Leotine Price or Jesse Norman or something like that, you know, they do opera. Mm -hmm. And they do it very well. And if you know opera well enough, you probably could even make a case that they're bringing a black sensibility mm -hmm. to opera. But it is opera, meaning it grew, it developed in response to the expressive needs and desires of a particular group of period over a long period of time. In other words, that form evolved to express the world as they understood the world, right? So yeah, black people can enter into that and maybe excel at it. 
But that's very different from Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. who not only is bringing her individual genius to what she's doing, but she's also operating in a form that evolved in direct response to black people's desire and the pressure we put on musical forms to express how we understand the world. So mm -hmm. that's the difference to me between the black cinema and black people making cinema. Right. Because just because you're black and you blow a horn don't make it jazz. Right. And the same thing, just because you point a camera and you're black don't make it black cinema. It just means, that, you know, and that could be all right, you know, for a black person. We could celebrate that. Hey, so-and-so got the point of camera or they won some award. But I do think it's important to have a critical distinction because, like, and that's why I always go to the music so often. Right? We say we're going to talk about music a little bit. I go to the music so often because I think, like, black people, when it comes to music, we are aristocrats. Mm -hmm. We really, really do, we feel our music. And we don't really care. Yeah, we want to win a Grammy. Or, you know, some artists might want to win a Grammy, but nobody's going to say this artist is better than that artist because they won 10 Grammys. You know what I mean? Like, has George Clinton never won a Grammy? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, and it doesn't really even matter, you know? I know Trouble Funk ain't never won no Grammy. Or, you know, Rare Essence, or, I mean, for DC Go-Go heads, Rare Essence, <laughs> Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers, I'm pretty sure they've never been nominated, you know what I mean? But I think it's important to just make that distinction, and so my whole thing has always been not to say X, Y, and Z filmmaker is better than this other filmmaker because of whether they are black cinema or not, because, you know, I, the world is not built like that. My favorite filmmaker is actually Andre Tarkovsky, he's a Russian filmmaker, so it's not like like I say, remedial. It's not remedial. The world is complex, you know. So, but, but I do think, you know, at the end of the day, because I do feel like the, the real thrust for me is like, how do we actually take this particular medium and transform it so it's better suited? Like opera would be for, you know, maybe Italians or something like that. Um, it's better suited to sort of describe the world as we understand it, uh, you know. So, so a lot of times I'm not even so much interested. Sometimes people be trying to tell me their stories or narratives or something like that. And I kind of, yeah, you know, I glaze a little bit because I just think we have a zillion narratives to tell. But the question is, how, like, how do we tell them? Because as you said, you can put a black person in that thing and they can end up just replicating the same old stuff, you know. So, yeah. You want to show a clip? Oh, yeah. You want me to show some first? <laughs> Since you, he didn't want to tell me which clips he was going to show. So no, I, didn't, I literally didn't know. I don't, freewheeling up here. Uh, let me see. But I know what I'm going to show now that you say that. Clips. Let's see. McCarno said. Because uh, I showed some things before which are really good, but I, I kind of saw them. I don't even know if I want to show them again. Uh, you got to show that lady singing. Okay, I'll show that. And then I'll, maybe that's the last thing I'll show. So, this is a this is actually kind of cool because it's got a few things in it at the same time. And are we gonna kill those lights, right? And I'm standing over here. Go Mary, go Mary, go Mary, 
totally took that song. I like Adele, but she sort of made that her own. So, um, oh, okay, I'm going to stop this. Um, yeah, and it's funny, you know, it's, um, I was looking at it, and I was cringing because it was sticking on the uh, Aretha thing, but so many of the things that I'm personally, like, interested in are things that actually build on what a lot of people would call accidents. Like, at the same time I was cringing, for the audience in a way, I also was like, wow, that was an incredible edit. Ooh, did you see that one? <laughs> you know, um, I can still remember being at Howard years ago and uh, standing in the uh, uh, HB, I think, uh, WHBC, I think it was called. They had a television station. 
And uh, I was in the control room, and they used to get a, sil- a satellite feed from, I don't know if it's BET or somebody, they got a satellite feed. And if you're in a station, you can see the signal. They have two monitors on this thing called a time-based corrector. And uh, there's one monitor where you can see what the signal looks like. But sometimes, because the images are being downloaded from out of the air, they, uh, they, they stick. And what that time-based corrector does, it's a buffer. So like if you have, like say, a sequence of four frames and two frames don't come down, what it'll just do is automatically repeat the frame that is in the next gap in the sequence until it finds the right frame and it'll lay it. So, but, but the effect of when you look at it is super like staccato stuff. And I still remember just like one of the most amazing things i ever seen in my life. Uh, and what it does, it then it, it flattens it all out. And then so what you get at home is something that's been like woven back together. It's been smoothed out. But if you actually stand there and see it. And I think like, you know, to my whole, my whole thing so much around black cinema is like, I mean, basically like accidents and like and how you, how do you um, wield those things to a certain kind of expressive like sort of possibilities. Because, you know, cinema is only 100 years old and people... It's like funny to me, like they think like everything's been done, even inside of what we would call narrative cinema, which is not, you know, not experimental cinema, but they think everything has been done, but it's, it's kind of not because, you know, all people all like Americans, Russians, Japanese people, like if you go to any different place, you can see how people have very different ideas about how you're just supposed to organize the universe. I was just reading an article the other day about how clean Japan is and the whole thing, and it was just talking about it. But I know that from, I was in with my son, Kyoto, like about two, three months ago, and it was like, we were walking around and no trash cans anywhere. You know, and people don't put, they, you know, they don't put trash on the ground. So we were literally, I was like, oh, this could be a short film, like where you had this trash, but you just gotta carry it around. And like, it would be a certain point at which I would, I made my son carry the trash, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, until we found somewhere, and they literally don't have trash cans around, and so that to me was a really, you know, that conversation. I had this other conversation with him when we were in um, we were in Tokyo at I think it's Shibuya Square. It's that famous like the Times Square of Tokyo that everybody's seen with the monitors and stuff. And we were walking through there, and Godzilla was in the theater. So that was interesting to me. I was like, oh, Godzilla's in the theater in Japan. You know, I'm in Japan. <laughs> and my son was asking me something about Godzilla, and I said, um, he said something, and I said, oh, yeah, Godzilla is is how, I said, Japanese people are the only people who ever have atomic bomb dropped on them. And Godzilla was how their attempt on some social level, not they consciously did it, but obviously it was an attempt to process the trauma of that experience. You know what I mean? Like this thing that with this monster that was made out of radioactive fallout, and he comes and he just destroys, devastates everything, you know? And I said, black people need their own Godzilla. And and I've been thinking about that a lot because I do think it is goes back to the question of the music and why I keep going back to the music. Uh, somebody, I was talking to my friend Greg Tate recently, and we were, t- you know, like everybody had Toni Morrison on our mind a little bit, and she had this very interesting quote where she said something to the effect of like, yeah, the music is really great, but I don't know if the music is going to be enough taking us into the next right. century. And we've had a, a like kind of ongoing debate about exactly what she meant by that. Did she? Because the music clearly has done the heavy lifting. I would say most people would kind of agree with yeah. that. Um, but the question is like, well, if she think the music is not enough, is it because there are some shortcomings in the music, or is it because the music has changed in some kind of way? Have we changed in some kind of way? Does she think literature was supposed to pick up the slack? Or you know, these are very interesting questions to me. And I said to Greg, then I said, well, you know, I think the thing about cinema to me that's so, the potential of it for black people is so powerful. Well, there's a couple of things. One of them is just strictly a power political philosophy thing, and that's it. It's like the world is too complex for anybody to control it anymore. You can't control things anymore. But what people can control is spin. 
Like, in other words, Arab Spring happens. Nobody can stop Arab Spring from happening, but they can control how we understand what happened. The narrative, history. exactly. And that's what the news and cinema and all these things about. So cinema is really important, almost like on some, like Sylvia Winters talks about level. It's important because it allows us to de define, like, the current epistine, meaning the underlying philosophical notion of a moment. And as Sylvia Winters has pointed out, I thought incredibly if you don't control that, it doesn't matter what you do. You just end up repeating the same right. thing, you know. So, uh, so cinema is super important on that level, just to control spin in a world that's too complex for anybody to actually control what's actually happening. And so, so beyond that, though, is the whole question of like, you know, going back to this whole question of the music again. It's like, how do we make this thing? behave or do the way we, you know we want to do it because the unfulfilled potential of cinema i think like david hickey this art writer critic i like a lot he wrote this essay and he made the statement that i think is true but i never seen anybody just write it as boldface as he did he said the dominant cultural form of the 20th century was pop music and i.e was black music mm -hmm. because pop music is black music in its various manifestations he said that was the dominant cultural form of the 20th century. Now, I think that's true, but anybody who would want to debate that or disagree with that, but the only other thing you could put up against popular music would be cinema, obviously in the 20th century. It's clearly cinema or popular music. I think it's popular music. But I think what that means is that if we understood that the dominant cultural form of the 20th century was essentially a black cultural form, right? And cinema is the only other thing that you could even say it took up as much social and psychic space. Uh, and we could talk about cinema specifically, why I think cinema was great or is great or was great. But so it's almost like there's this space where these two things never really got to come together, like meaning uh, black aesthetics, which was driving black music. But we never really got to see black aesthetics play itself out in cinema because one is in a very expensive, outside of architecture, maybe the most expensive art form, and also because there was so much power at stake in terms of this being able to control the narrative about the world. It gets to shape perception. Exactly, exactly. So the potential of cinema and the music coming together is something that I think is longed for on a certain level, but also feared, you know, Definitely. because of all the implications of it. So anyway, that's my little bit of ramble about it. I appreciate that. I think for me, um, when you talk about black, when you talked about black cinema just now, you mentioned accidents. I think also if you're thinking about black cinema, you're, you're also thinking of absence and lack. You know, like for example, when I made an ecstatic experience, I was fresh out of grad school. I didn't have no money, you know, and so I'm weaving things together, you know, in my kitchen, like you know, like a black woman, right, taking the curtains and making an outfit. Vibration you know? cooking. Right, exactly. I'm taking whatever is available to me and now trying to craft a mood, you know, or trying to craft some sort of emotional register with scraps. You know, so I also feel like that's a part of our maneuvering or our techniques yeah, around, around black cinema. Yeah. But music for me has been this kind of structuring, and I've said this multiple times, a structuring element. Like if I don't know where to begin in the edit, I know that I've been listening to a couple of songs or a playlist on repeat, and I can pluck one of those songs out and lay it in that avid or that premiere, and I have an instant mood and I have mm -hmm. an instant structure, regardless of whether I'm going to use that song or not. You know, I right. might completely scrap it. Right. It may be a dialogue scene, mm -hmm. or I might cut to it and it's now a, a kind of montage. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's literally giving me the format, it's giving yeah. me the, the, the framework and structure. But that, ha that happens a lot. Like, you know, one of the things that I've sort of articulated, you know, I think it was a hypothesis, but I think it's kind of, you can't debate it on a certain level. I think like if you look at contemporary art practice or art in the West, clearly African ed uh, aesthetics by virtue of African artifacts initially completely transformed Western art practice in the 20th century. It's just you can't, yeah. it's no way to get around it. Like those artifacts come they come, you know, they come from from Africa, from the colonies, and they f eventually migrate to Europe. And uh, European artists get a hold of those things, and it completely changes the way they understand the world. I mean, you know, the beginning of modernism was 
called modernism and Western art is like Picasso's De Moselle and Cubism. And it's clearly, if you see De Moselle, it just literally has African women in it. Right. Uh, and in fact, even, you know, it's really funny. I, I didn't figure this out to about, well, I say about, but it's maybe like, I guess it's going almost on 20 years ago. But, you know, way, way back, I would have said, yeah, you can't deny it. But when I first saw De Moselle, people introduced it to me as Picasso saw African artifacts and he, you know, in his genius, which I do think Picasso was a bad boy, uh, he, uh, he came to a, a complex understanding of those things and then he, you know, and he made Cubism out of it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, like uh, the Picasso Museum came out with this book about, probably about 10 years ago called Picasso and the Dog Mirror. And what it is is, uh, and I, I can only think they came out with this book because they're scraping the barrels a little bit in terms of like things to come out with by Picasso. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, because as a Cala resonator has everything he's ever done, you know, but these, they're like going through his private stuff that I try to figure out. And this was like photos from Picasso's private collection. And in that, you see these photographs taken by this guy named Fourier, who was a French photographer who took pictures in Africa, right, in the French colonies. And it is de Moselle. Mm. Like, literally, you see it. You know how those women's arms are like this? You see the picture of the sisters with, her arm, with their arms like this. Yeah. A lot of times they were holding, uh, baskets. you know, baskets and th things on their heads. So it's not just that he saw it got, and got it like formally. He literally structured that painting based on these actual pictures of black people, black women in particular's bodies, right? So the whole question of like black people in contemporary Western practices like super, super complicated because you get this first instance where you get those African artifacts and they completely change the game. And I've said this part a zillion times, but you know, you got Picasso and you got uh, Matisse and these guys and they're seeing these beautiful artifacts and start to inform how they structure space and all these kinds of stuff. I mean they saw them and they realized that they were looking at artifacts that understood the world in a very uh, uh, non-Cartesian kind of post-Einstein, you know, relative moment. In other words, a lot of times like an African sculpture is a figure looked at from multiple vantages in space and that's like a radical break with the Western vanishing port, single, ego, I am, all that stuff is bound up. These visual systems are bound up together. So, um, so when they see these artifacts, it just blows open this whole system that they had. And so hence they do cubism, which is basically like seeing objects from multiple vantages simultaneously. But the thing they don't fully understand or don't get because they are still looking at it from a Western frame, even though it's an alien artifact, is that what they're calling multiple fixed vantages because they understand things as fixed vantages as opposed to, it, but it's just a single fixed vantage in the Western art system. It's not a fixed vantage, it's a dynamic vantage. So like Robert Ferris Thompson pointed out that a lot of those African artifacts that ended up on pedestals in the West, you know, object, subject, relations and stuff, subjects have agency, objects don't, they just sit there and they get you know, moved around, you move around as a person with agency and see that thing from different perspectives. But in a traditional context, those artifacts moved around the viewer as much as the viewer moved around the artifact. Because oftentimes those things would be on people's heads being danced yeah. and, they and functional. They, yeah, they had agency. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I was saying this to somebody once, and they said, oh, AJ, they don't really have an agency, they're still being driven by subjects, meaning they're actually subjects dancing the objects. But I say, no, that's how you depend on the world, how you understand the world, because in Voodoo, then that object is driving absolute, the person, is riding absolute. the person like a horse, absolute. right? Yeah. So it's a radically reorientation of the relationship between foreground, background, objects, subjects, slave, mass, all these kinds of things. Control, and so power, looking relations. Exactly, all of that. Mm -hmm. So you see that in, that in that work. And then I always like to also point out too, this is why Duchamp is the baddest of any of them cats, because he made his paintings new descending that are that same thing, looking at an object from multiple points in time and space. You see the body at the top of the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs simultaneously. But Duchamp was just smarter than anybody else around him. I believe that. And he peeped something that nobody else peeped, which is that besides the fact that these things were incredibly dense uh, configurations of 
black or African philosophy, right, and so they had different ideas about the world and how the world was structured, a lot of the power of these things had to do with the fact that they were radically alienated, mm -hmm. meaning they were radically in opposition to the context in which they found themselves, and that, that produced a certain kind of energy. Absolutely. And Duchamp was interested in that, and I really think that's how he came up with the urinal, mm -hmm. because he was trying to figure out how to replicate the energy, the power of that tension that was happening. And, you know, I still think Duchamp, I know I've debated this with people. He may not be the best artist of the 20th century because best is so relative, but. He's the smartest. Well, I think his work opened up some questions that everybody's still trying to answer, like, like both you and I, in terms of our use of quote unquote found footage, like what's on the other side of a ready made. Right, right. You know, so. And that was just with African artifacts. That's not to speak of when you got Negroes actually on site <laughs> making shit which is what happened with the music again. It totally transformed everything. Even when you were talking about uh, listening to music to structure your thing, it's like Lee Krasner has described it. Like when Jackson Pollock was making paintings, he would listen to a jazz record like 200 times in a row. He would just put it on loop and listen to the same record while he was painting. Now, if you were painting a tree or an apple or a person, maybe what you're listening to doesn't matter as much. But if you're not painting anything, there's no subject in your painting, except the process of putting down the painting, I think that the, the music you listen to really does matter. And for me, and for I think a lot of filmmakers, it's really about a kind of emotional register, which I've mentioned earlier. And what I feel like, and this is something that we might have in common, this background of this kind of spiritual background, this church background, um, and I'm trying to segue into the gospel real quick, <laughs> um, because I feel like that's something that I'm thinking through a lot. Um, I'm not religious, you know, so to speak. I'm, I'm more so of this kind of primordial African tradition, spiritual tradition now. But I was steeped in this Pentecostal kind of Church of God and Christ tradition. And it is a kind of, even though I'm not in that, it still kind of lurks and lingers all over me. What's the gold standard for right. us? Absolutely. Like you don't. It ain't jazz. It ain't pop music as much as I think it changed pop. And face and Absolutely. all that. It's not. The gold standard of emotional of authenticity is it's still the in the church. Yeah. So we've got some gospel clips that I want to bring in. Okay. Which one you want to see? Well, you, will you tell me. We'll play one of yours. Let's go. The one that says, I am God. It's a shorter one. Okay. I know I think we only have a few more minutes. Oh shit, we got 15 minutes. It's like, oh, I could be talking. I can't, I can barely <laughs> inhale in 15 minutes. This is like, um, oh, sorry, wrong here. Say? Yeah, it's out. Sorry, I put here the Smithsonian clips. Okay. okay, which one did you want? The first one. So this was one that I listened to a lot as my mama put it on all the time when I was a kid. And I just think the affirmation of I am God is, is really amazing. And plus, she's giving you rock and roll like hardcore prototype, proto rock and roll, it feels like.
That's like a bop. <laughs> it's a real bop, like it still bangs. So when I was little, um, and I grew up in the 90s, I was born in 84, but I grew up in the 90s, and y'all remember 90s R&B. So my mother is an ordained minister. My father's side, there's all ministers, my grandfather, my father, great-grandfather, super religious. So there was an embargo on secular music in my home. I could not listen to, you know, Jodeci. I mean, you're crazy, right? We had to listen to all gospel. So I'm like a gospel connoisseur, you know? And so I would find the ones that, you know, had a little, you know, a little bop, you know? <laughs> um, and then I would, of course, sneak Tupac and, you know, Quad City DJs and all the other 90s shit that people were listening to. But we had to stay, you know, in the blood of the lamb, constantly, you know? And I'm grateful for it now. But back, back then, I was like, what is wrong with this lady? You know, I just want to hear In Vogue. I want to hear Whitney Houston. But yeah, I love gospel. We started to have a little bit of a conversation about Whitney Houston. We kind of, she was like, I'm I don't not... want to argue with you in front of these good people. Yeah, she was like, don't, don't, don't. Should you we can't have be, the, be... the Whitney convo? Because I have a Whitney clip now. We can play it now. And we can have the convo since you want to talk about Nippy. You, I mean, you you know I can stomp Whitney with my clip. You know my clip will stomp Whitney. What clip you got? You know the one, Leandra. Okay, yeah, yeah, that'll stomp Whitney. So we can talk about Whitney, but I think you should play your clip. Okay. Uh, look. If you want. Whitney, Whitney, of course, is magnificent, but to me what Whitney Mac represents more than anything, and it's, it's, it's probably not fair to reduce an actual person, but at, you know, to an idea, 
But, you know, the person was over there, but when we try to understand the world that's over here, I think it's different. You know, I try to be uh, very clinical on a certain level about it. And for me, what Whitney mostly represents at the end of the day is a certain de-evolution of black music. Okay. I hear that. And I, and I don't mean like she's not virtuoso and all that kind she's of stuff. Virtuoso? But we know virtuosity don't make you the best. That's it true. just doesn't. And I'm it not doesn't. saying she's the best. You know, I come from the church, so I, know, I see the best all I'm the time. I'm just saying, like, for me, like, despite her obvious gifts and talent, at the end of the day, I think when we look back at it 100 years from now, what we're going to think Whitney represents is a kind of disconnection of the formal dimensions of gospel, black music, mm -hmm. from real authentic feeling. Do you feel like this is because of her kind of platforming, platformed as a, a pop star? Because of what she was... No, because through? like there's a ton of pop stars who do incredible stuff inside of the pop arena. Sam Cooke, Marvin Gaye, James Brown, you can go on and on. Like, you know, there's a lot of people who do something, but like, for me, like, she opens the doors for Christine Aguilera and all these people who do all this... They do all these... The pyrotechnics. They take the form. Yeah, they do all the these emotion. pyrotechnics. It doesn't mean anything. And you feel like that's her fault? No, I don't think it's her fault. I think she's emblematic of it because I okay. do think she was born into a tradition where mm -hmm. she should have been something else, but she actually took a bad, it's like Darth Vader or something, you know? She went, she, the force, she had the force, but she went to the dark now side. Now I really want to play my clip. Listen, to me, when you say she went to the dark side and I don't want to remove Come on, her, she totally went finish. to the dark side. I don't want to remove her agency because she was a fully formed human being, but she has Fingalis around her. You think Whitney Houston is, is, is making and plotting her entire career? It's Clive Davis. No, no that's making, no, you can't demonize Clive Davis. Oh, but we can you demonize can't. Whitney Houston. I'm not demonizing her. I'm not demonizing her. I told y'all I don't want to argue with my good I'm uncle. Saying, I'm saying what stage. she's emblematic of. I'm not demonizing her, but Clive Davis is not responsible for Whitney okay. Houston's choices. Can we table this for when we argue on the phone? Because look. Oh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Let's, let's see another clip. Come on. Let's let the Holy Ghost feel this place. Right, Mama? <laughs> Hang on, I'm I think play. we should show Whitney, though, since you want to drag her. I feel like we need to. We, we need to kind Whitney. of. I'm just saying. Yeah. They sing Whitney. They don't. And the phrasing is great. The way that I feel like in black music, and one thing that I'm taking from black music is this notion of a, a phrasing the way that the language is being delivered. And this is what you see in gospel. This is what you see in jazz. This, you know, like there's all of these riffs, all of these kind of like electric moves that are being done see, with the to language. to me at the end of the day, that's just a, that's a formal argument. That's like that's how- That's what I'm talking about, form. But I'm just saying, by that same token, we could say Christine Aguilera is one of the greatest- Form and emotion. Form and, like you said, she's, she's, they're devoid of that. Form I think both emo. of them are devoid. I don't think Whitney Houston is devoid of emotion when she was singing. Yeah. Anyway. Let's like watch said, the gospel clip. <laughs> I mean, not to equate a person's artistic realizations with their circumstances, because we know our circumstances are complicated. Mm. But I think, man, it's so deep. We could just have a conversation about the whole trajectory of Whitney Houston being Sissy Houston's daughter, being Dionne Warwick's cousin. niece, cousin, kind of, right? I mean, I can't, I don't even, I'm about to say stuff, I don't even want to say it, in, I don't even want to say it in public because I don't want to get in trouble. Let's table it for the phone argument. <laughs> and let's just watch the gospel thing, yeah? Because this is going to be really beautiful. Don't quit. Oh, no. Listen. I don't want to start this. I shall get home someday. You got to keep your mind and your eyes focused on Jesus. But not only that, but you got to keep thinking about a better place. Every time I get where I want to quit, I look around. And this world is no place to quit in. 
No, no. I want a better play. Yeah. Music world gospel Hammer. recording artist, Hammer. Leandria Hammer. Johnson. Heaven. Heaven. Not Harlem, heaven. Not Paris, heaven. Not San Francisco, heaven. Heaven. And with that in mind, don't quit. Just getting by, letting you figure me out. Oh, oh, I have to call on his name, y'all. Jesus. Oh, I love that name. Yes, I do. for real.
We're not comparing the two. We ain't Whitney's gotta... bad, but she she yeah, never no, she this can, is something she, else. She never yeah. touched that. No, this no, is sorry. something else. But Whitney is from the tr the tradition, though. Let's not I didn't let's say not she forget wasn't that. From the tradition. I never said that. She's from this. She tradition. actually is in the tradition. That's why it's such mm -hmm. a fall. Okay, we said we was gonna table that for the conversation on the phone, brother. <laughs> okay, I think there might be questions, right? Any questions? Although I want to show my trailer now. You have to walk to the mic, I think. I'm just curious. You've kind of showed us this, but I'd really like to know when you're inspired or when you're working, what music and what artist do you listen to? I mean, a lot of a lot of jazz. I like a lot of Alice Coltrane. I think she's brilliant. Um, I listen to Erica Badu a lot. She's from Dallas, like myself. I listen to a lot of contemporary music, but I'm, a, I'm I listen to a lot of the older stuff. Nina Simone is like my favorite artist of all time. If we're talking about a consummate genius. To me, she is exemplar. She's above everybody else. That's just in my opinion. I think Stevie Wonder is phenomenal. I'm listening to a lot of old soul, a lot of R&B. Um, I just got into some crazy weird, like free jazz. Ornette Coleman is from DFW Metroplex, which is where I'm from in Texas. So really been thinking about a lot of his work too. It's so strange and weird. Anything that's like a mood, a vibe, a tone. Yeah, me, I just, I don't know if there's any, you know, there's certain things I always listen to, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's a specific thing. Like, like increasingly, I look at shit from YouTube. I mean, I'm, I'm really taking most of my inspiration from that. I mean, but this is after 30 some years of listening to everything that Miles Davis or John Coltrane or Billie Holiday ever recorded, you know? Uh, but like in terms of just the space of what I'm really inspired by, like I honestly think my man, go marry, go marry, like honestly, who, who in Hollywood has done a moment more powerful than that? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, I'm just like, on the, like I'm gonna do the high low thing, but I'm just saying, empirically speaking, can you think of a single moment in cinema in the last 10 years that could stand next to that. That will wipe the screen with anything you put next to it. And I could show you a hundred more things off of YouTube that would do the same thing. And let's, so let's just keep it, you know, for real. Like for real, for real. YouTube is like, gold. Yeah, because it's black people completely unmediated. Mm -hmm. That's what's great about it. That's why so much of a shit too, because it's unmediated. Mm -hmm. but, but inside of that space, black people get to do exactly what they want to do. I mean, yeah, I could show you. That's this cat named Miscellaneous, who's really like phenomenal, who really is a video, he's an artist, like for real, in video. And it's really incredible. And it, again, it would just blow anything anybody's doing away, you know, so. Um, thank you. For me, um, <clears throat> a great artist uh, stabs me in my heart or my mind. And uh, today I feel like both of your work has done that simultaneously. So it's really an honor to have you here in DC and um, you've just increased the IQ in a super smart town all that much more. I'm really grateful. And um, I guess I have a question about process and there was something also that you mentioned earlier. This is going to be Kind of like three points. You well, mentioned let's just something keep it about to one. file. I'm, I am. Keep the one point. But I'm yeah. just going to put them out there. You mentioned something about we're not trying to get a file, and then, and then in playing all of your clips, what really came to me and comes to me when I see your work is that there's a speaking of truth that has its own agency in one in an artist's work. And I just wonder, in your process of creating, when, you're, when the truth is unleashed, how, how can you possibly even ultimately 
control that. Like, I know that there are more eyes on you every year you work. It, is, am I asking the question clearly? Maybe uh, not. Clear enough. I, I guess I'm asking about the balance of speaking your truth, as you do, so clearly, and continuing to do that fearlessly, no matter what. I guess I'm asking. I don't Can think you, you have talk a about your process a little bit with regard to fearlessness. Well, I try. Look, I try not to over um, mythologize what I do. I just go for the dope shit. Like honestly, Period. I don't be thinking about I don't be thinking about truth or none of that stuff, or you know even politics. All that comes in afterwards. Mm -hmm. A lot of the best things that I've done, I didn't even completely understand them till afterwards. I I would I've been showing like even Lover's Message, I would be showing things and see things in it that I I mean I swear I did not see that. Mm -hmm. And once you see it, it seems so almost like I know if I had a seen it, if I wouldn't even kept it in there because it seems too too premeditated almost, and I didn't even see it, and somebody, well, what about so-and-so? And I'm just like, yeah, you know? Uh, I try to just take credit, you know, for everything <laughs> in them, but like, but honestly, that really is, I'm not, I'm, you know, I've been a little funny, but I'm being re really honest about that. Mm, I try to, my thing is to be, like somebody asked me this recently, and I sort of answered it like this, and I like, the way the answer came out, I just, they were asking me about how I was understanding myself and people seeing me and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good now. You know what I mean? I'm happy. <laughs> you know, people ask me if I'm happy all the time. And I'm like, well, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a yes, no answer to that question. It's an existential question. But yeah, I'm doing all right now. But the reason I feel very confident about where I'm at now and what I'm doing and what I'm committed to, because I know it's not ultimately about me. And I'm not trying to be egoless or anything like that. I have an ego just like anybody else. But there's a point at which you realize that you're part of something that's larger than you. Yes. That's what I was trying to map out earlier when I was saying the cinema coming together with, with the music, which is really just black aesthetics. It's bigger than you. Yeah. He's like, John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Charles Parker, Miles, all of them bad cats. But you cannot discuss any of them out of the context of who they were surrounded by. Mm -hmm. And that clearly is something that's happening with regards to black people specifically entering into the art world, which is a, art, it's a context which in 1999, when I had my first show and was in the Biennale, I dropped out of the art world, essentially walked away from it two years later because I got tired of going to parties and I was the only black person there. Mm. It's radically different now. It ran me away. It really literally ran me away from the art thing because I was like, I'd rather be with the failed black filmmakers than the successful black artists because there was more sense of community. So I, un I try to understand myself as a thing before I'm a person or artist or anything. I'm an emanation mm. of something that's happening. All these forces, black aesthetics, African people coming to these shores, all these kind of things, I'm a drop in a tsunami. It's coming. It's about to change everything, for real. I truly believe that. Thank you very much. So that ties perfectly into what I wanted to ask. Um, I have a parent that has been incarcerated for 16 years that was recently released, and I felt um, emotion and compelled to share my story in order to um, inspire others that are also similar to myself. Um, that's something I've always kept hidden through most of my majority of my life. And I was just wondering what advice you would give for that initial of removing yourself and your ego from your work in order to reach that higher purpose because there's that initial standoff that can kind of make you hesitate from jumping into um, a work that you want to create. Look, um, I wasn't suggesting you remove your ego from it. I think when we say ego, I don't necessarily think it's the classic Freudian whatever construction of ego. I think black people got to have an ego just to survive the shit. Exactly. Do not give up exactly. your ego. Yeah. You got to have your ego to survive this, right? Um, like, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. Oh, ego. Everybody got ego. Okay, you wouldn't find more raging egos in any art form than you would in hip hop, right? Most people would agree, like, you know, just the Wu Tang clan. 
They're not egos. They're exactly. all egos. Yeah. Exactly. They're ego, super egos, mm -hmm. right? But they're in a band together. I guess that, that, that completely goes against the Western logic we've been taught. Like egos don't work together. But if you look at the whole history of black people creating things, it's no split between having the biggest ego in the world and working with other big egos. It's like X-Men or Super Friends or some shit. That's how we <laughs> don't, you need your ego, keep your ego. I, can I say one more thing just in sure. addition to that? Just in terms of if you feel almost shy because of the society of what's created to almost make it feel shameful to be able to share a story about incarceration, to remove the ego of being afraid of how that's going to be receptive. Think of the people that you're talking to, exactly. of the people who need to hear what you have to say, right? Get real clear about who your audience is and what you're trying to say to them. That clarity from me kind of helps remove any of these kind of questions or doubts. Exactly. Usually I have a feeling that's bubbling up inside of me whether it be rage or whether it be whimsy. Mm -hmm. And I know I want to communicate that. I want to reflect that to a very, very specific group of people. I want them to feel that as well. Thank you. <laughs> no, just to add to what you said, it's feeling. It's your feeling. You got to respect your feelings around these things and do. You can't, even with black people, you can't even wait for black people. You have to do what you feel in your heart you should be doing and that's what you do uh, you commit to your vision of the world and hopefully black people get with it or somebody gets with it but it doesn't matter you have to do what you think is right Period. so thank you hey what's up y'all i just want to say thank you for having this conversation today uh and your contributions to the culture my name is david mcduffie uh and uh arthur joff you mentioned the, uh, the fact that sometimes you don't um, premeditate what it is that you're doing. And I know uh, you've spoken before that one of those moments was the fact that Kanye's ultra light beam on Love is a Message was something that uh, kind of happened in terms of the way, the rhythm of the flow. And I find it interesting that as you all are having this conversation about spirituality today, he just did his uh, uh, Sunday service uh, at Howard University. So- uh, oh, he did at Howard today? Yeah, Damn. yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, could you, one, uh, if you both could kind of give your views on Kanye Sunday service, and uh, if you can tie in also maybe like uh, what you think, or if there's an artist that you feel black cinema could be the soundtrack for, who do you think that black artist would be? Hold up, I, I wanna completely understand. If there's an artist that, um, so you, you, you liken cinema with black music. If, do you think that there's a musician, um, it could be living or dead, preferably living, but that has, a music or a mood or tone that uh, resonates at the, the, the level of cinema that you think should, should match? It's hard to I'm choose one. a thousand people, man. Okay. I really, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but it's just like, like this whole dynamic of I'm talking about of black people and this whole tension with cinema. Like if you think of silent film, what's the soundtrack for silent film? Ragtime. That's black people's music. I think that completely is not an accident. And when black people, like, if you look at Shaft or Superfly like that, you can't tell me what Curtis Mayfield and Isaac Hayes did. That was a breakthrough in terms of soundtracks and movies. Like, even if you listen to that stuff now, they got that right. The cinema was dragging behind that music. That music was dragging those films forward. Into, even in the 90s, if you're yeah. talking about Waiting to Exhale, you're talking about Set It Off. Is anybody talking about Waiting to I'm Exhale? <laughs> I'm talking about the music. The soundtrack dragging the, mu the movie. That soundtrack, the waiting- didn't even drag that movie, it just left it behind. <laughs> the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack is so, it's just leaps and it's a beautiful soundtrack. Yeah, but I'm just saying that's not like, how many people are looking at Superfly now? And thinking about the music? But how many people are listening to the Superfly album now? Okay, I'm listening to the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack. That's what I'm saying, but that's what I'm saying, so. I mean, just the, back to his question, it's like, it's a zillion things, like classical music, for example. Um, most people do not have classical music as part of their actual social life, day to day. No. Classical, most people understand classical music because it's being used in cinema. It's a platform. It means that music doesn't, in that context, does not have to function like pop music, the environment of pop music is like a battle royale. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, a bunch of people in there fighting. 
survival of the fittest. Classical music is like a goldfish in a bowl, right? And there's something beautiful about a goldfish, you know, flicking around in a bowl, but it's not the ocean. Pop music is like the ocean, do or die. But there's something to be said about having a fish in a bowl. And what cinema will provide is a context where black music doesn't always have to do triple somersaults just to get heard. It could just be the fish. It can just be the, the fish. Bowl. Okay, yeah. hi. So we're gonna have- Oh, Sunday service. <laughs> Just because on the religious thing, he's right. Okay. Then. And then we're going to have just Sunday two services. more questions, and we're going to try to answer them in five minutes because we've run uh, fully 15 minutes over. So We're 15 Ooh, minutes 15 over. 15 whole <laughs> minutes. <laughs> you a mess. Um, Did you have it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Sunday service is amazing. Kanye is, as often the case, I don't want to say he's leading so much, but where he goes is where a lot of us are going, I think. And I have some problems with, with Kanye, uh, Sunday service. Right. I, you I, have a problem with Sunday service or him? I have some problems with him, him and Sunday service, quiet as is kept, um, because I feel like he's using Sunday service as this kind of, it feels like this kind of platform where he's aggregating a bunch of people around emotion to what end? It's the same Let me in think. any church. My question is to what end? You could say that about any church. Of course, and I do. I critique the church openly. The homophobia, the capitalism, well, the patriarchy. That, I, so that critique, that critique me, ooh, could Arthur. hold for any church. I'm just sorry. And it can hold for any church, and I do. I, I've given you the critique for the church, so I'm giving you the critique for Kanye and Sunday service. It's beautiful. The, <laughs> the young people are here. It's beautiful. And the young it sounds people will great. clap about anything. That's not true. That's not true. Yeah, not you true. can find a young That's person who will clap almost about anything. They clap for you. They love you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> They'll clap about anything. My point is, I can't look at Sunday service. I can't look at, at any audience, uh, artist removed from their context, removed from what they support. I'm anti-fascist. I'm anti-white supremacy. And I feel like you can't cloak gospel over fascism. Right? You can't, you can't use Sunday service as this opportunity to aggregate all of these wonderful, beautiful people with these amazing voices and still be aligning yourself with violence, with like a, such a raw form of like open violence. When did he do that? I just remember. When did he do that? <laughs> no, I'm just trying when to When did say Kanye West align himself with fascism? You mean like when he wore the Trump hat? That one time, is that what you're insinuating? No, that it no, was no, no, okay. no, I'm not insinuating that. I'm I, think, I think Kanye West is a genius. To me, he's the Miles Davis of hip hop. He's sh shaping and shifting and he's leading, like you said. However, I have some problems. That's all. You can tell him to call me. I know he's your friend. <laughs> or as somebody put it, he's my boy. And as I say, he ain't my boy. I think. I'm not into discarding black people. I'm di I didn't say he's Hold canceled. Up. I'm just saying, let me finish. I didn't finish. cancel nobody. I'm not here with carceral logic. I'm not into discarding black people because they said some crazy shit. Because a bunch of us say crazy shit. All the time. And do crazy shit. All the time. Even in the church. All the time. So I, I don't understand why he's getting singled out. No, because he asked the question. <laughs> He asked about Sunday service. And I told you about Sunday service and the person who leads Sunday service. Are there other questions, Brother Matt? <laughs> um, and speaking to that um, in a less political way, I, I, was, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to be at Sunday service this morning and then coming here and hearing Donna Lords and uh, being steeped in the Pentecostal tradition myself. Um, as a film MFA student at Howard, I've had conversation with Dr. Missouri um, concerning Arthur, your, uh, your theory on cinematography um, as it is, um, I guess you've likened it to jazz. And, and speaking to Miles Davis, I think this ties in. Um, what it, if you can share with that, or, or even in this case, cinematography possibly being akin to gospel and the, the feeling that it evokes. Um, well, they could be. Could be. <laughs> well, mostly it's not, obviously. Mm -hmm. Very clearly it's not. Mm -hmm. um, 120 second version. Mm -hmm. When I studied at Howard University, my mentor was Haile Garima, 
they proposed the idea to us, which he had brought with him from UCLA, uh, that there could be a black cinema, meaning a cinema that was authentically an expression of how black people saw the world, but it had to be transformed. But when they first gave it to me, the way they talked about it was in, I would say, somewhat reductively political and aesthetic terms. Even though politics and aesthetics, that's still a big feel. But if you ask them what was black cinema after they said it had black people in it or it was political or stuff, you, they couldn't answer beyond a certain point. In other words, I didn't think polemics, a polemic answer, is just what black people do was enough. And so one of the things I became very preoccupied with is technically and formally, how, how is it different? Like we actually say it's different, not because we feel it a certain way, but how is it actually different? You, Black music is clearly different from other musics. You can talk about how it's different. It's sort of propensity towards rhythm. It's propensity, propensity towards just intonation. There's a lot of things you can talk about. So it seemed to me very quickly that we had to figure out how to take the medium, technically speaking, and transform it so that it was better suited to express how we see the world. I'll give you one quick example. Like, I'm very obsessed with this idea of motion in cinema. Motion is the very basis of cinema. But if you look at motion in cinema as it exists now, it's very much a manifestation of what I would say a Western view of the world. In other words, cinema went down a particular path of regulation. It got regulated. Like, if you look at silent film, they use what I call, inadvertently, but they use what I call uh, irregular exposure intervals. All that means is that basically when you crank a camera by hand, the space between the exposures is uneven. It's not the same. When motorized cameras came in, a lot of people think that hand, motorized cameras hand, displaced hand crank cameras immediately, almost like moving from a horse and drawn buggy and then you got a car who wants to continue to have a buggy. No, it wasn't like that. It took 20 years for motorized cameras to displace hand crank cameras because hand crank cameras produced motion that did something very different from motorized cameras, right? The only reason motorized cameras displaced hand crank cameras is because when sound came in, the engineers stepped in and overruled the artist and said in order to achieve perfect sync, right, the camera and the recorder has to be driven metronomically, meaning the space between each bit had to be the same, right? That's an engineering decision, it had nothing to do with art, right? So what happened is now we, now everything that we see, whether you shoot at 24 frames per second or 48 frames per second, doesn't mean it's all metronomic. The gap between each exposure is always the same. So it's very important to me for us to re-unengineer that, you know what I mean? To reverse engineer that and go back to irregular exposure intervals because there's a certain possibility there to synchronize that with things like black vocal intonation, mm -hmm. right? You can make motion that actually will be transfixing. Like when you hear Aretha Franklin or James Brown, that's like if you sample them, you hear it and you know it's James Brown. It's not what he's singing. There's actually something about his tonal signature that registers for black people. We have to start there. We have to make a two second motion that you know is a black motion mm. and then build from there. Arthur Jaffa is a genius of the American South. <laughs> I'm grateful to have him here with me and I'm grateful to have y'all. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Jatavia. Thank y'all. Thanks for coming out.